the 24-hour city, I think, is quite interesting because Sydney actually often gets criticised for not being a 24-7 city, and that, in some respects, has actually been focused on a single issue, probably wrongly, and that issue is um, bars and lockout laws, which we have as a, a unique thing in this city. But it has led to an overall criticism that we don't have a 24-hour city. I think, um, based on the City of Sydney's discussions this morning, they are trying to do some of the things that you are presenting in terms of getting different uses um, in some of those buildings, creative hubs, childcare centres, etc. But I guess from your perspective, um, being the expert in the field, can you almost give me a scorecard of where we are in terms of what we are doing well, given that we're criticised so heavily, and, and what we do need to do better in the Sydney context? I think what is good is that, um, so, so now, now the CBD is really focused on office buildings in the day, and there are quite some open places where you can have a drink after work, and sometimes even late, a few complexes. And I think this is a good point, because we are mixing usage that do not compete with each, with each other, and the main criticism that Sydney received was from the residential, residential areas. Yes. And so being able to combine nightlife with office uh, areas, I think it's, also, it's a very good starting point to the 24-hour city. And also because it can help to maybe spread a bit the peak hour effect, yes. because people would want to stay where they work or where they were, yes. and in order to maybe come home a bit later. Or also, we, in, in another perspective, there is also a lot of gyms, for example, open very yes. early. Yep. And this also helped to, sp to spread the peak hour effect because people's, people can go to the gym before going to work. Yep. And so I think this is a, a good combination. And what would need to be increased is maybe the, the communication through the community yes. and the residential area. And also, if the nightlife would not be that um, diabolized, if I can say, yep. Yep. Uh, then people would be maybe more uh, responsible with their drinking mm. and with their behaviour, and then it would just be simpler. Mm. Yeah, I think I got from your presentation, we're, we're a little bit further, but we've got some way to go, so your, your ideas were, were great and interesting. So. so the central London is usually an office environment, and now it's changing to become a residential environment. So if you take, for example, Fleet Street, I think they're putting over three to 400 residential properties. So its usage is becoming 24 hours. Mm. So the question is the maintenance of the infrastructure because it's a 100-year-old Victorian sewers to the last speaker. You know, how do you get rid of the waste? Um, how do you supply the electricity? How do you change the environment? So when you take an old city, an older environment, and you change its use, it's not just about the buildings. It's about the entire infrastructure. So you've got the Thames Water, you've got the Transport for London, you've got the energy companies, and it's a big problem. But when you're looking at the developers, they're just looking at costs, and they're not wanting to spend the money on the infrastructure. So I'd just like to see all three of you on your views of that. I think uh, uh, legislation, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a driving factor. Um, I think the Sydney Water Programme is, is a very good one, and if London uh, needs to do that in a holistic approach. I think that is, uh, that is the key word. Um, so sit everybody together and, and, and work it out. Um, incentives for builders, it's, it's always about cost. Uh, and if you don't stop that, uh, it will always be about cost. So it needs to be governed. I think in London, what you're seeing here in Sydney, this is a good thing. In fact, it's perhaps a very sustainable idea to create greater utility and livability out of these buildings and not always have to build new and build out. We're replacing, regenerating within the city center. But maybe to answer your question, we should begin to prioritize what parts of that infrastructure need to be centralized and shared and which can be decentralized and maybe implemented at the scale of a district. Like I thought a lot of the conversation from from Boss really suggested that, that although we're talking in a high rise, a lot of what you talked about could be for a mm -hmm. you know, six block area. And I think that sort of research investigation probably has another chapter to go, but that might be a way to address exactly what you're saying, but also put it in context of sort of the fiscal and economic realities of you know, doing something.
and continuing this momentum and recycling of buildings within the city. I think you make a very good point. And if you look at tall buildings, I always refer to tall buildings as the Formula One of the building industry. So when you take that initiative and, and, and make those constructions change, uh, the, const the constructors and the architects and the engineers will automatically take those initiatives and for the other, uh, uh, other buildings that they are building. And also the big uh, architects and, and, and constructors are uh, being looked upon by the smaller ones. So that will be a, a copy movement. I think um, I completely agree on the, we need to densify what's already existing and not extend, because this is kind of the easy thinking that, we are, oh, there is a blank spot here, let's do something. Whereas if it's blank, it's probably because it's not connected and because it was not meant to be in the city. But I think we need to address the new problems with new solutions. So obviously, not everything is ready yet. But in terms of maintaining infrastructure, I think we have also a big challenge in optimizing infrastructure because infrastructure are not growing as fast as the population. And this is one of the main issues that we are trying to address here. And I think before we were not so stressed about infrastructure and the answer was to keep building, whereas now it's really about making the most of the investment and if we can use existing infrastructure for different purposes or organize differently the way we work, maybe through different times of work in terms of maintenance, complementary times of uh, maintenance with activities. Being an architect that gets involved in tall buildings quite a bit, um, I'm interested to know what level of subsidy do you think has to be kind of provided for you know, some of the very good ideas you have in terms of how we might reuse water more efficiently because every time we do a lead um, application, um, you know, the kind of water recovery and cost of doing it is always the first thing that gets kicked out because mm -hmm. it's expensive and the storage is expensive. So there needs to be some element of carrot and stick. So do you have any view of what could be done to kind of reverse that kind of thinking from a developer's mind? Um, not precise and not a percentage, but um, what I hear as well is insurance premiums, that if you actually have a, uh, a good certified building that the, the, the insurance premiums will go down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I mentioned an example of, of Japan uh, that also subsidizes these initiatives. I can't give you a clear answer on the, on the, on the real percentage, but it has to come there, uh, that, that there is an, a, a fiscal or a uh, financial incentive to do it. Otherwise, it just get, gets chucked out. Yeah. And I have a question for Doug and Lauren as well. Um, uh, Doug, I think you touched upon it, but uh, I'd be interested to know what both of you think of the kind of impact the autonomous vehicle is going to have on our cities. To, you know, from a very, from a transport and carbon emissions kind of perspective, but just how we might start thinking about repurposing car parking decks and below grade parking, which is gonna obviously have a reduced demand. Car demand's already going down. And there's a view that within eight to 10 years that uh, you know we'll all be using autonomous vehicles. So I just wonder what you think the infrastructure impact might be on cities in terms of maybe solving a few problems, maybe creating some others. I'd just be interested to to know what your view is on that. You could say that it's happening right now through car sharing. Mm -hmm. And that sort of the absence or the reduction in private car ownership has seen dramatic shifts in how people get around, how they look at where they live. Um, and congestion has not gone down on roads and city streets. It has, however, though, sort of decrease the need for the car park. And I think up at Barangaroo, you'll see that, that only 4% of the work population comes by car. The rest come by shared or transit because of the connections to Wynyard. But I think, uh, Russell, our hope would be that if the autonomous vehicle came on, that it would be a sort of rethinking of the public realm and what maybe might be a way to reclaim space. But um, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of research that is suggesting that may not be true. And that because the cars will be continually moving, 
looking for the next rider, it, it, it may not change. But I, I would hope that it would create new opportunities. I just think we need further research. Some figures say that um, one autonomous vehicle would be able to remove about seven regular cars. But this is based on the willingness of people to actually share the ride. And I think for me, this is a critical point. Autonomous vehicles are not the solution for the future. They are really part of the whole system. And we will still need, uh, we will still need mass transit, of course. But autonomous vehicles will definitely help the parking issue, for sure. Uh, but yeah, they are not the only way. Can, can I just add? I, I do think to separate personal mobility from logistics and sort of trucking through cities may allow us, like, like we showed, I think, in, in the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, we, ways to reconsider the amount of freeways we actually need, and perhaps a, a rethinking of, of how we look at those larger uh, or broader connections through the city and how we move goods. And Sydney, it, I think it's part of their 2056 plan. So it'd be interesting to see how they consider that. In Southeast Asia, I, I come from the Philippines. We have so much water during rainy season and dry season, hardly any water to drink. Is there any way you harvest the water from the highlands before they flood the cities and store it during, to be used during the rainy season? Have you done studies on that? And another thing, like in my country, we have 400 rivers and too, maybe too much of it overbanking every rainy season. So maybe one way of doing it is collect it from upstream instead of flooding the cities. And dry season, you have enough water. Have you done a research on that? No, I, I am not very much thing. aware of that. But uh, if you look at uh, one of the desalination projects uh, in the world, is actually that the seawater is actually pumped up to high reservoirs that are created like an open mine. Um, that is a, a big natural storage uh, facility. But I don't have a. No. It, it, One more thing: the developing world. Uh, most of the drainage system is designed only for 25-year flood history. Most of the super, super typhoons happening now, the hundred-year typhoons yeah. are now happening almost every year. So the infrastructure is 75 percent undersized. They are. That's and that is scary. That is scary. It needs to be. Uh, you you. In rainwater runoff, you need to have a good primary system, but more importantly, so your emergency system, eh, when the primary system fails, needs to act properly. And you can, you, 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 we, need to, we need to act upon that. That is true. And it needs to be planned for the future. A lot of times we, we plan and we design within the parameters of a specific project. Or perhaps, in, in your case, a municipality. But Water does not have boundaries. In fact, it's defined by a greater watershed. Like Netherlands. And perhaps yeah. that's where some of the solutions lie, is to think at the scale of the watershed yeah. and how to apply these technologies more broadly, mm -hmm. not just specifically in areas where you're seeing that issue firsthand. Um, Doug, I liked, obviously, your presentation being a Sydney sider that I can see all the links between density, population, car use and mass transit. Um, I guess for me as a professional, that is a no-brainer. Um, it's interesting, in Sydney at the moment, you heard the $73 billion worth of um, infrastructure investment. And we seem to be heading back into a climate of uh, community criticism for overdevelopment. And I don't think the politicians are necessarily explaining the link very well. So, but what, so I'm not asking you to be a politician, but I'm just wondering, given your international experience, how you might help us maybe reset that negative conversation when it should actually be a positive conversation. These investments and priorities are often discussed in the public domain. Mm -hmm. So what, what we've seen is the need to demonstrate holistic thinking, comprehensive approaches, but also to demonstrate whether it's a single project transportation investment or sort of storm sewer water reclamation, mm. that there's also a public benefit. It's not just about the economics, but it's about sort of the larger benefits to society and to the community.